Last week on Earth. Last week on Earth. Now to the main event, the triumphant return of Miss Sophia Bush to the podcast. She and I started on this podcast back in 2011, the Don't Be a Dick Pledge, if you remember that far back. Something the world needs now more than ever, so I may as well give you that URL. If you'd like to sign the Don't Be a Dick Pledge, if you have not yet, something the world needs desperately is just us promising to not be dicks any longer. Get rid of the dicks. Tinyurl.com slash Don't Be a Dick Pledge. And you can follow Sophia on social media at Sophia Bush and tweet along with this podcast if you'd like. So without further ado, Sophia Bush, my dear friend, is an actress, activist, entrepreneur, and global education access advocate, named one of the most charitable celebrities by CNN. Sophia devotes her free time to bettering girls' education and the environment. She also co-founded and sits on the board for I Am A Voter, a nonpartisan movement that aims to create a cultural shift around voting, a cause I care so much about as well, of course, and civic engagement as well by unifying around a central truth. Our democracy works best when we all participate. It's just that simple. Her podcast, Work in Progress, features conversations with inspiring people as they explore how we are all both masterpieces and works in progress at the same time. Now, 10 years later from the first time she appeared, on this pod, it's Sophia Bush. Ten years later, her triumphant return. <laughs> Hello, Sophia. Hi, old friend. How are you? I am good. How are you? Good. Good. Thank you. Uh, the world's changed a little bit. Yeah, just a, a wee bit from when we were so idealistic and ready for everything, I guess. Yes, we were, it was 2011, end of 2011, beginning 2012. Wow. We were in my apartment. We were drinking cocktails. You could actually go to people's apartments and hang out with them then. Yes, you could. I remember that life. <laughs> and uh, now we are very much the opposite. We are, you are in another country. You're quarantined. You're not allowed to yeah. see humans. No, nope, I'm not allowed to leave this room. I am quarantined in Canada. Uh, I can't. Future. Tell us where you are and why you're there. Well, I'm here. So I'm here for work. Um, much like the things that have been delayed for everyone this year, the job that I was supposed to start in February of 2020 was delayed. And we are now going to begin in February of 2021. So when people like to yell that I have no clue what it's like to be affected by this pandemic, I'm like, oh, oh okay, sure. <laughs> um, sure, just, you know, 12 months later, finally being able to do the job. But with all the COVID protocols and things, getting to Canada, there's a mandatory two-week uh, isolation quarantine. And when I tell you I'm not allowed to leave the room, I mean, I'm not even allowed to take the trash out. I can't walk to the end of the hall to the garbage chute. Oh, really? um, if, I, if I do so much as that, it's a $700,000 fine. So, yeah, I'm right. just in this room. And when, when you asked me if we should, you know, have a 10-year anniversary cocktail, I, I said, uh -huh. I wish. But I have no booze here. I have nothing aside from the groceries that I stocked up on um, when I arrived. And I, I didn't even get to stock up on those, actually. Someone from the production had to do that for me. Uh, mm -hmm. And now I'm just locked in here. <laughs> really? So you can't even, like, order order deliveries and things? You can. Uh, they have a whole sort of contactless system with the, you know, folks who manage this place. But I also don't really like to put people out, so I'm trying not to, to wow. do that. Too much. But you're, you're like in a quarantine apartment. Like, are people monitoring? Do they know you're not running rampant, going to bars at night? Yeah, yeah. They call and check in to make sure that you're here. Um, and again, you you have to you have to report to them, and then you have to report into a number to the Canadian government, to the health service. And if you're caught lying, you know, seven hundred k. And I don't know anyone who has seven hundred thousand dollars laying around. I mean, I guess Jeff. I guess Jeff Bezos has lots of seven hundred thousand dollars laying yeah, around. Can, Other than him, like I don't know who's got that to just like throw at a fine. It's not a problem. You're on house arrest. You've lived as an exemplary human, and you're still on house arrest. Yes. 
It's like you're Andy Dick. What's happening to you? I don't know. But I'm very excited to, you know, get to work. What's the what's the project? Can you tell us? Yeah, it's a it's a TV pilot. The show's called Good Sam. It's one of the best written scripts that I've read in years. God, Katie Wesh is such a good writer. And Jenny Ehrman, who did Jane the Virgin, is producing our show, and she's brilliant. And it's just so much fun to have this really badass team. And I can't wait to do it. But you what know, genre? it's a it's an hour drama. It's it's all taking place in a hospital. I get to play a heart surgeon, which literally is what I wanted to be growing up. So it feels very full circle. Um, my parents are very amused about the time that I told them I wasn't going to go to medical school because I wanted to be an actor. They, they find this very funny. So you know, <laughs> it's, it's good. It's healing old wounds in the family, too. That's beautiful. I like that. Yeah. At least her daughter can say she's a pretend doctor. Yeah. And That's I mean, before COVID, I was I was shadowing heart surgeons and, you know, scrubbing into uh, ORs. And it was the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. So I'm excited to actually get to do the project now. That is so cool. I wish you the best yeah. of luck in it getting picked up. Thank you. So just to catch you up and the world up on the last <sighs> 10 years. Yeah. I do have a comprehensive list on what has gone on since, but it was the end of 2011. And we, uh, just from the descriptions of the episode, the two episodes that you did in our first season, 10 years ago, um, One Tree Hill had just ended. Yeah. That long ago. Um, you and I started the Don't Be a Dick Pledge on the podcast. Yep, love it. Which is still going. I still tweet it occasionally and it's got signatures. We need, it, we need it now more than ever. Yep. Making people promise to not be dicks and to stop others who they see being dicks because otherwise yeah. you're being a dick proxy. Yeah, Occupy Wall Street. Important. Sorry, go ahead. I said it's, it's pretty important. It's very important cause where the world doesn't, we get it less well than we did then. Yeah. Occupy Wall Street was still going. Uh, the Republicans were still demonizing Planned Parenthood. We talked about that 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, we were still at odds with Iran and uh, talking about the danger of water bottles. Obamacare was being debated whether maybe they'd be able to pass it. And we were approaching a fiscal cliff, not necessarily mm -hmm. being able to fund our government. Um, now we are in a new decade and everything is on fire. Everything is on fire. Yeah. I, I miss those good old days. Uh huh. Well, we've just gotten a fire extinguisher. I mean, a, a new administration feels like the beginning of some potential relief. And I think, you know, Biden's first, I mean, where are we? 10, 11 days now, 12 days. Yep. I, I, I've lost count. I live in a one room box. I'm, time has melted for me. But anyway, he's he's been in office not even two weeks. And, you know, he's taking incredible, swift, progressive action to, you know, pull us off of some of those cliffs we're about to, to run over. But God, the last four years, you were you were saying it's hard to have a list of everything that's changed. And I was thinking about the fact that Amy Siskin wrote a whole book about it, about every norm that was broken every single day. She, she made oh. a book out of the list that she began keeping on Twitter. Um, that's how many things were shattered. So I'm hoping we're, we're entering into an era of some repair, but wow, the sort of um, tolerance of terrorism and abuse that has been launched upon us is, is really something to behold. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I mean, I, tweeted something a week or so ago, or no, I actually talked about it on the podcast last week, was that it's insane that that even most in the Republican Party now say at least that they hold the Capitol rioters responsible mm -hmm. for a terrorist attack basically in our in our own country. I mean, it is a domestic you know, terror attack. It was domestic terror, 100%, but that yeah. they do not hold the leaders who incited it responsible. And as I said, Osama bin Laden didn't fly the planes. Right. The people who cause the thing are more responsible mm -hmm. in a much deeper, grander, more serious way than the foot soldiers. It's, yeah, because the foot soldiers are following orders from the leader. 
Right. You know, it, and, and it's something that people in our world are so, they're so hesitant to hold leadership. And I use quotes because what has Donald Trump ever led, um, aside yeah. from a handful of companies into bankruptcy. But <laughs> prolific at that. So hesitant to hold leaders accountable for their behavior. I don't call him a leader, but he is a figurehead for a domestic terror movement. Mm. That is true. When security yeah. experts from around the world and our own national security experts say so, that matters. And for some reason, sanity, reality, those things have seen have have sort of sin, ceased to matter or or have been assigned less weight than they deserve um, because he was just so unhinged for so many years and it's frustrating, but it happens everywhere. I mean, you know, I had a producer on a show get fired because he didn't report that I was assaulted by a coworker after I told him because he was legally responsible to do so, but the coworker who assaulted me didn't get fired. Right. And I was like, huh, this, this feels like maybe the wrong carriage of justice. This, yeah. What's happening here? So Why are we so beholden to power, afraid of holding power to account? You would think it would be know. the easiest way to prove your mettle, to show what you are as a human being, is to say, hmm. you maybe you discuss leniency for the foot soldiers, but never for those who incited and lied and deceived to or or had performed hmm. egregious acts. And that, those were the who lied for years, incited violence for years, started this big lie about election fraud, when in reality, all data, everything points to the fact that we had the most secure election in history. They're, they're now trying to launch widespread voter suppression off of this, which was always the goal about lying about it in the first place. You know, when when they announce at their fundraisers that they don't want more people to vote because then Republicans will never win. I mean, they literally admit this stuff on camera, on tape, on TV. Right. And then people say, well, well, they're not responsible. It's like, well, what more does someone need to be responsible? And yet there is more. And yet there is more because Trump said it all. I mean, the, the big one, I think, you know, people are like, oh, he tweeted to come on this on January 6th. It'll be wild. Yeah. He, and he also that morning said, let's fight and you have to be tough and you get to play by different rules when you yeah. get uh, an election stolen. You get to be tough. You have to be aggressive. But people forget the biggest one that he was directly asked, will you assure a peaceful transfer of power? And he said no. Yeah. That directly is... You're telling your followers who it's clear as they are, rabid as can be, I yeah. don't want a peaceful transfer of power if I lose. That is the all the proof you need to convict him in his second impeachment trial coming up next week. It's really so crazy that this could be up for debate. But, it, you know, it's funny. I was, was talking to Zerlina Maxwell um, at the end of last week on, on her show, and I said, I'm shocked, but I'm never surprised. Mm. I've, I've lost the ability to be surprised, but I'm still shocked at such dereliction of duty and miscarriage of justice. It's hard to fathom. And that might be, you know, strange to hear from me sitting in a hotel room in quarantine wearing a sweatshirt covered in steaks and french fries. But like, <laughs> you know, it, when you look around and you realize that we are now living in a time when so many citizens have more honor have 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 more of a relationship to the constitution than our elected officials that's a problem for me yeah so how how do we fix it because it seems clear as day that the biggest problem facing the earth certainly our country but also planet earth if you look at even what's happening now in myanmar a yeah. active coup over the you know fledgling democracy over there yeah. by just claiming a fraudulent election it's the exact same thing um we have to regain our gri our grip on truth it really is whoever can figure that one out will save mm -hmm. the planet and probably make a billion dollars doing it whoever figures out the platform that vets truth that we all go on for our collective mm -hmm. set of facts or something in the future yeah how do we do it and why aren't we taking that more seriously because we can't we we're living in a reality that isn't one shared version of that. There's no right. way to move forward. Well, I think because we're also assuming that the truth is enough. 
Lies spread 1,600 times faster on social media than true facts. So we have to look underneath. We have to look at the psychology. We have to look at the psychosocial storytelling aspect, the emotional relationship that people have to their opinions and their bias. Because everybody does. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, you have foundational beliefs. And when those foundational beliefs are shaken, it can be very traumatizing. However, I can say that for the spectrum of ideas that I that I will respect in discourse of public life. I do not, I want to clarify, consider domestic terrorists launching right. riots at the Capitol and attempting to execute our congresspersons and senators. I don't consider them part of the spectrum. I consider them to be domestic terrorists and criminals who deserve to have no place in public life. So very important distinction there. But we have to begin to look at our ability to learn new information and change our beliefs based on what we learn. To inspect, I'm, I'm reading this great book um, that Adam Grant, you know, phenomenal uh, psychologist researcher uh, who wrote Option B and so many other incredible books that have changed my life. But his new book is all about how you can be adept at rethinking. If you approach problems, your business, society, the way a scientist does. Always looking well, for evidence for hypothesis. Hmm? Always looking for evidence for your, instead of looking for evidence for your hypothesis, you're saying. Well, you're, you're, always, you're always looking for evidence. If you're a scientist, you have a hypothesis. Right. You're looking for evidence, but you have to consider anything that disproves it and what it means. And if your idea is disproven, you have to come up with a new idea based on the data that you're taking in. That's how science works. That's how right. innovation happens. That's how technology is created. That's how lives are saved. You know, that's that's how uh, we invented the bypass machine and then eventually the ECMO to save patients in heart failure and people who are dying. You know, we, we bring people back to life now because of our willingness to examine ideas and change our minds and find the solution. But when it comes to our person- didn't like his book initially, and then upon rethinking about it, they did. Mm. Well, when it comes to personal ideology, it's hard to recalibrate feelings. And that's mm -hmm. something I actually take great pleasure in. And investigating and being willing to inquire and, and recalibrating is what has taken me on the path to ever deepening activism and social commitment. And it's not to say I'm perfect at it, I'm not. But to see this cult worship, because that's what Trumpism is, this is a cult. Yeah. Uh, a group of people who do not believe COVID is real when it's killed 400,000 Americans, that's a death cult. Mm. Stopping people at vaccination sites from getting vaccinated, that's a death cult. And it's that's one of the worst because most cults in the past, like as tragic as it was, it only affected like 20 or 50 or 100 idiots that fell for it, not mass millions of the population. Right. And so, again, we have to be very careful with words. And I want to communicate that I do believe there's a spectrum there. I, By the way, I'm a human. I walk the earth. I have a family. I have hyper liberal and conservative people in my family. You know, I, I don't live in, it's funny, people like to scream on the internet, you live in some extremist leftist bubble. And I'm like, you don't know where I live or who I live with, but okay. Um, but the thing is, we have to be willing to have dialogue with people of differing opinions. But again, if you are a person who is throwing your body in between a human being trying to get vaccinated against a deadly disease and their doctor, I take you out of the equation and I put you in the terrorist pile. Yeah. That's not rational behavior. And we have to look at as a society how to communicate the truth in terms of community, in terms of social responsibility, in terms of how to be part of a society, which by nature means we are in a grand community. We have to get smarter about how we talk about truth and not just assume that sitting and spouting facts and data and statistics is going to be what sways people. We need to talk to people about their families, about their faith, about their children, about their communities, whether those are rural farming communities or high rises in crowded cities. We have to be in communication with each other as human beings. 
beautifully said. I agree. I think that boils down even in some ways more, more basically to the fact that f despite being on what I consider the oftentimes the evil side, but the bad side between right and wrong, the wrong side of moral issues, the mm -hmm. right of our country is so much better at speaking to those things, at speaking to people's emotions, at speaking to the kitchen table issues that matter to people using fear of they're going to come and take your guns, come and take your rights, come and take your freedom, come and take your unborn babies. And they win. They win every debate because we are too intellectual about it and we try to be fair to everybody. How do we combat that? And I'm curious, how do you combat that in your own family then, the, the family that you have the conservative people? Because we all make allowances personally sometimes for things that we go off on Twitter about so blindly. So how do we, or blanketly, how do we reconcile that? Well, Again, I, I think it's incredibly important to understand where people are coming from. But this notion that um, they're better at it, I disagree with. I think they're more conniving. The right has sought after that idea in newsrooms, like if it bleeds, it leads. Go with trauma, trauma, trauma. And Trump really did it. I mean, he, he launched our country into a trauma parade. It was endless, it was brutal, people are exhausted, burnout and depression, those numbers are through the roof. And, and the thing is, I wouldn't say they're better at messaging, I'd say they're better at lying. There is yes. a popular idea that Democrats support full-term abortions, that's not true. Right. Right. But if a baby has encephaly, meaning it's going to be born without a brain or a brainstem and die, and it's endangering the life of its mother, and they say, deliver that baby early, so that it can pass away in its mother's arms, that's that's a procedure. And they're claiming that that's an abortion. You know what right. I mean? The, the worst thing that could happen to a woman and her partner, they are politicizing rather than saying that poor woman, the baby that she wanted to have is dying. You know, these are really grotesque things to be willing to do that, to be willing to steep so low, to, to be willing to behave in that way is difficult. And, and to be willing to claim that immigrants are coming to take your jobs and all of these things, that's not actually what's happening. Some of so the greatest companies in America that employ the largest numbers of Americans were created by immigrants. They've so built their economy. Yes, of course they do. Of course they do. Yeah. And so I guess it's I, I, voting that, and it's lies, like you say, that, mm -hmm. that, that blames them for things that they actually contribute to our, our society. Yeah. But how do you do it? How do you deal with it in your family? How do you deal with those conservatives well, it's really Can interesting. You, I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with something uh, not so much in my family, and I'll get there, but I'm dealing with it today publicly. Um, you know, Congresswoman Jackie Spears said, okay, if they're going to continue to lie, if, if you know, her, her Republican colleagues are going to continue to scream that because she is on the side of, you know, accessible health care and COVID relief, uh, if they're going to continue to scream on the House floor and, and the Senate floor, let's be honest, that... Uh, the Democrats advocating for relief bills like this are the quote radical left. Then her, she was surmising that we should call all of the Republicans who are apologizer, apologizing or apologizers rather for the terrorist attack on our capital. She said, well, we should call them the terrorist right. If they're gonna you know, scream at us, we should scream back. Right. And I said, go for it. And people went ballistic. Uh, Breitbart accused me of labeling all 75 million Trump voters terrorists. And so the irony is that they're very mad that I've supposedly called them something which I didn't call them. I was referring to Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, Lauren Boebert. Those people absolutely are terrorist apologizers. And, you know, then you're kind of a terrorist. Yeah. And, uh, and How do you separate? And yeah, you how, how do you separate? You don't because you can't. And what's so interesting to me is that all of these people who are very offended by the way that Breitbart manipulated and obfuscated my point is they've swarmed into my DMs um, to, you know, call me certain things I won't repeat because they include racial slurs. Um, they've called me a cunt, a whore, told me I'm good for nothing but getting gang raped and trained and choking on cum. Oh and that bullets taste the same in every language. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the men who actually threatened to get his boys together and gang rape me is a, a US Marine veteran, so that feels great. And, and that's what you're willing to say on air, holy shit. Yeah, and that's what I'm willing to say. 
So imagine how bad they get. And the really interesting thing is I'm, I'm sitting here going, so you've been told I said something about you that I didn't say, but even if I had your defense to right. being supposedly called a terrorist is to terrorize. It's, a, it's to prove it's it. To threaten rape, assault, and death. So weirdly, you're proving the point that your right-wing outlet claims that I made about you, that I actually made about Ted Cruz and a handful of other horrific terrorist apologizers in elected office. And yeah, so are, yeah. the, the level of abuse is not normal. Mm. And, and that too has been incited by Trump and Trumpism. But that... And, and so when you say, how do you deal with it in your family? The irony for me is, though it is more personal at family gatherings, no one in my family is telling me they're going to come to my home and bludgeon me to death with a baseball bat. Jeez. We're having civil debates. And I... Ooh. I Women deal with this stuff so much worse because I say similar things. Oh, yeah. and you're a whole higher profile than me, but it's no doubt because you're a woman that you get that, that kind of language. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, do you separate it then, Sophia? Because I'm dealing with on a smaller scale the same thing just today. You know, I tweeted that anybody who still to this moment supports Trump and doesn't mm -hmm. acknowledge that he incited this is responsible for the, just speaking about COVID is responsible for the shutdowns and the deaths. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. even if you're not the five that you mentioned, Holly and Bobert and Yogurt and whatever their mm -hmm. stupid names are, okay? Mm -hmm. Even if you're not one of them, if you're still not realizing that when you're in a crisis moment, as a yeah. country that you have to then jump your allegiance from the fiscal issues that still keep you technically on their policy mm -hmm. side to the moral side, you then are responsible for it because it's just, you're mm -hmm. not the executor of it, but you're the ones that are, are allowing it. It's exactly mm -hmm. like those who just didn't speak up during the Nazi Holocaust. It's saying yes. we know that we are allowing this to happen. We have the ability to stop it from happening, but we are not going to. That is just being cowardly while being while terrorizing the populace. Yep. I do not so, disagree. And then I and then I get a response from somebody saying, So you're calling millions of us responsible for the death? You're calling us murderers? And my first instinct was like, oh my gosh, that's going to live online forever. I want to take that down. I, I feel bad yeah. saying that. But then I didn't and I doubled down because, yes, we have to put our foot down. We can't stop. At, we can't continue forever ad nauseum till the world burns to the ground, pretending like these are two equally valid sides. It's right yeah. versus wrong. But it's also been happening forever. You know, it's, it's the right. same... It's the same false equivalency that was made at the time between the KKK and the Black Panthers. It's the same false equivalency that's being made now between insurrectionists and domestic terrorists who planted bombs right. around the United States Capitol. But news is up. Better. It's not the same. More police officers were injured in the one day insurrection at the Capitol than in an entire year of protests in 2020. It was like it was like 100 plus police officers, right? 140. Right. And, and counting, I imagine, because there are people who are succumbing to injuries. You know, reports are still coming out, but the last one that I saw was 140. Right. And so that's, again, it's not even as easy as, and stark to realize as mm -hmm. good right versus wrong, which I believe it truly is. But but always, it seems always mm -hmm. Republicans mm -hmm. in the country are protesting against people's rights and liberals are protesting democrats are protesting for people's rights that's yeah. a vastly different thing when you're protesting even sometimes passionately angrily not violently we don't advocate but angrily with passion yeah. for not being killed by police that is a beautiful defensible important protest and yeah. protesting to overturn the right of all of us to vote and have a say in our government because you don't like the result is protesting against the right to vote yeah it's always that when they protest mm -hmm. against a woman's right to control her own body, you're protesting mm -hmm. against someone's rights. Yeah. So how can how come we keep losing the messaging war? It's because they're better at lying. You're right, but we need to 
to like come up with like a brilliant cutthroat campaign. Like Lincoln Project did that better right. than I think our Democrats did this cycle. Sure. So lie, right. liar, liar. Brand yes. them better at these lies. Brand them better, certainly. But the interesting thing is that when you start playing at someone's game, they don't like it. Again, to take it back to today's example, Congresswoman Spear said, okay, if you guys are gonna do this to us, we'll do it back to you. And people went ballistic. Ballistic to the point that because I was one of the, I'm, I'm assuming by now, hundreds of people who said, yep, totally agree. By the way, I sent out 59 tweets yesterday. I'm in quarantine. What the fuck else am I doing in this room? <laughs> it's like, it's thought after thought. And, and I got singled out for it purposefully. And they know, Breitbart knows what they do when they attack women that way. They know, and they don't care. They get off on it. And because otherwise, why would you do it? Why would you incite violence and terrorism against someone? Terror, I should say, against someone, unless you like it, who in their right mind would do it unless they liked the way it felt to do it. So the drama and you know, they don't like it when we stoop to their level. Mm -hmm. And by They're the way, no stoop, we're stooping with the truth. Yeah, exactly right. right. Yeah. You want to sling mud, we'll sling mud back at you, but this is true. It's radical to think that in the richest nation on earth, people should have health care. It's radical to think that in the richest nation on earth, we should spend a couple trillion dollars to bail the nation out of a global pandemic. That's radical, but giving more money than is proposed for said relief bill to billionaires who don't need it is not insane. Like, what are we talking about? What are we talking about? This is, these are not the same things. Yeah, and it's because we don't ever draw a firm line in the sand. Yeah. I, I, I filmed a clip last night on the news. The anchor was talking to whoever they were interviewing about the, um, about the, the 10 Republicans, the 10 so-called moderate Republicans that are trying to get Biden to spend less than a third of what we urgently need to save our country and save our lives. And she goes, so they're open to a certain level of funding for um, pandemic relief, but they're not open to increasing the funding for schools. I found that interesting. Yeah. For as long as we keep finding that interesting, instead of an egregious attempt to ruin our children's lives <laughs> is how we will never get past this. Yeah. Yeah. What are we talking about? Interesting. Also, the idea that they want to compromise at that $600 billion number. That's what they proposed in the first place. So it's not a compromise. Right. They just want right. their way. And again, I, I don't understand how, you know, there are people on earth who are allowed to be trillionaires, but we're not funding healthcare in schools. Come on. I'm not saying, look, you created Amazon, you invented, I don't know, whatever gadget that you sold for a couple billion dollars. Great. Have a house, have a vacation house, have five vacation houses, have a plane. Do you? But how much do you need? Right. Would you notice if you had a hundred billion dollars, would you really notice anything past that being gone? Would you? Exactly. Could you no. ever spend anything? It's like, what are we talking about? And, and you didn't just make that money. You made it because of your employees. You made it because of the people whose goods you sell. You made it because of all these people who can't pay their mortgages and their rent. How is that all, justifiable? It's not. And again, and all, I'm not yeah. saying let's make sure everyone gets paid the same. And if you're some brilliant engineer and you invented life-saving technology, you know, you should make the same as, you know, the guy in his internship at whatever one of these high rises. I don't know what anybody here is doing at the moment. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying past a certain point, isn't it enough? Why can't we have a wealth tax? Why can't we tax the billionaire class? The fact that I pay 42% in taxes and billionaires pay 3% in taxes yeah. is insane to me. It's yeah. insane to me. I'm happy to pay my taxes. I don't know why they aren't either. Also, no. not either. Yeah. The fact that the stock market, I can't speak English anymore. <laughs> None of us can. We're all a jumble of of expletives in our brain <laughs> filling our thought bubble. But I mean, the the fact even that to me that stock 
income that capital gains is taxed at a lower percentage. What do you mean? The money that's not tied to your man hours is taxed less? That's speculative money. That should be taxed more because you don't need that as your base to live. That's not what you, you can just let that money make yourself money. So at least tax that the same as the rest of us. But this is the problem. We live in this world where this last week, GameStop, you know, finally these these yeah. people on Reddit, people try to take the power back and, and, and stick one to the people who've been manipulating our markets for years. These hedge fund short traders that that for, yeah. for we're betting against companies, betting that which should also be the housing crisis. Who caused the housing crisis? Exactly. Housing. Exactly. Oh. And 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 they bet on a company to fail. So even when trying to stick one to these greedy stock traders, Still, just the inherent nature of people who aren't these fat cats was to build up a company they loved. It was to save <laughs> GameStop. It was right. to bring them back. And then Robinhood, the popular trading company, and others just shut down the ability for these people to store and make money to protect their rich hedge fund short traders that were betting against the American economy, betting against our companies to succeed. And you can't, somebody tweeted, you can't even make money when, when rich people make money on the stock market, they make money when it does well. And when, and when the other side goes, they lose money. And then even during a pandemic, you even lose jobs when the stock market does well even. So there's no chance for a little guy to win. You bring up the housing crisis. It's exactly like what I proposed in 2008 when we were trying to save the economy and we did that $800 billion infusion of money and they saved the banks and they bailed out the banks it was the simple idea that no one in government thought of or did, which would have been so easy, was if you're going to do that, I thought they should have let them, them learn their lesson, hit their rock bottom and go under. But if you're going to save the banks with all these underwater mortgages, these shitty mortgages, subprime mortgages, just give the money to the mortgage holders and mandate that they use that to immediately pay their mortgage. So then you would have at least helped both the regular people and the banks that held their mortgages, and you would have at least saved both. But no, they allowed everybody to still go under with their with their li lives, with their livelihood, with their chance to have any sort of savings. People went absolutely flat bankrupt, and they helped only the rich. We don't even think, yeah. how can we help people? It's never people over profit. It's a simple three-word mantra that then make all the money you want after that. But the thing is, when you help people, you increase profit. Right. Companies with more diversity and inclusion have a better ROI. Countries, like when you actually take care of your people, when you make healthcare accessible, the whole country does better because your workforce isn't sick. It, this stuff is not insane to think about. It's, it's not a fairy tale. It's not simply, you know, a moral imperative, which obviously it is. It's a fiscal win over and over and over again. And yeah, what's so right. interesting to me is that, you know, when I talk about taxing the rich, people come at me being like, well, you're never going to vote to increase your own taxes. And I'm like, that's actually always what I do. And you're I don't agree with it, but I'm going to do it. Yeah. What do I need exactly? Like, yeah, what writing that check still. Yeah. What, what is it? And it's and it's crazy to me that people get so angry when we talk about taxing billionaires and they say, you know, that's ridiculous and the government has no place. It's like, how much money do you make? Are you a billionaire? Do you do you do you realize that myself included, all of us are closer to being homeless in our lifetime than we ever will be to being a billionaire? So why are we not advocating for each other? I, I don't. I just don't understand it. That's another one of the big lies of the Republican Party is they convince everybody that they have a good chance to become multimillionaires and billionaires. And so they get them to legislate for a future that 99.9% .9 of them will never achieve. And they vote against their own current interests on some dream. It's a full on dangle this reality. Oh, when I'm rich, I don't want to not have a lot of money. You now don't have a lot of money. Look at your parents. I said it many times in my campaign, look at your parents. Most likely your financial result will be very similar to what theirs is. Yeah. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with working hard, with being successful, with becoming super successful, with launching a Good. company or inventing a thing. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. Even incredibly successful people aren't rich like you think they are. 
You know, when when Biden said not a single person who makes over four hundred thousand or under four hundred thousand dollars a year is going to have their taxes increase. I'm like, who's complaining? Right. You know, come on. What are we doing? I, I just think we've lost the plot. You know, this this idea of American exceptionalism and American progress and American innovation, like the best of us, because we have a lot of bad shit here. But you know, doesn't everyone? But you, you know, our our bad is bad. But what's good about this place is magical. It's aspirational. It's inspiring, and and to do those things, we do it as a country. And th this idea of our exceptionalism, I think, has been bastardized with an obsession with individualism. Right. Yes. You as an individual matter. You matter because you exist. You matter because you have a beating heart in your chest and a family and, and potential. But you are not the only person on the planet, let alone in this society. You do not deserve to be the sole person who reaps the benefit of the American dream or the American promise. That's not how this works. When you live in a society, you have to be part of a society. You want to be an exceptional individual? like. Okay, go move to the woods somewhere and build yourself a house and be totally off the grid and see how it goes. I really wish you all the best. Well, it sounds I'm nice some days for sure. Yeah. You know, like enjoy. We'll see how you do. But if right. you want to live in a place where there are roads, where there are schools, libraries, a military, a, a water system, those things we pay into, that a lot of Republicans love to scream about socialism, the road you drive on is socialism and the army that protects you is socialism and the water that comes out of your tap is socialism and the school your kids go to is socialism. Right. It, it's, it's, it's become this word that we assign to any societal benefit funded by taxpayer dollars, but that's not the case. That's just not the case. It's, it's like, it's a buzzword that's lost its meaning. It's like when people say social media influencers are authentic. I'm like, all right, we get it. Authentic has been ruined. You ruined authentic. <laughs> authentic you know, now when you stage every moment of your life. And they've ruined the term socialism. Is my life authentic for this moment I'm about to capture yeah. so I can present a particular I thing for the I'm authentic on this side? This is my authentic <laughs> side. Like, because, you know, yeah. When when AOC talks about what democratic socialism means, i.e. investing trillions in people, not in billionaires, people scream that she's a socialist. And it's like, no, she's not talking about Fidel Castro socialism. She's simply saying we have social programs in America and we need to readjust the budget because the budget currently does not reflect human priorities. That's all anyone's saying. Totally. But but an important thought there, that again, I think, is where we don't message well and we don't brand well. It's just yeah. a bad choice to call it democratic socialism right, because right. of how I agree. Nice Full transparency, yeah. I agree. I think it's a terrible term. I think it needs to be thrown out the window. Yeah. I'm like, That's why I, because the thing is, the, the history of socialism in places where there have been dictators has been so horrific for people that there's no way to like add a word and make it yay. For most people, exactly. most people have an ingrained understanding of something. And, and even if the two concepts are different, if you're using the same terminology, it's not gonna get you where you need to go. So exactly. I'm all for new terms, new branding. It's like, we're talking about a people's party. We're talking yes. about, yes. about American unity, about people paying their fair share to take care of yeah. their neighbors and their schools and yes. you know, subways and public transport. Like this is good for all of us. Yes, that's why, Sophia, the, the, the term that I think we need to use that I coined during my campaign, because I believe in capitalism. You do too. You love making yeah. money. I love making money. We want oh. to be as successful as we can while yeah. simply following the one basic rule, make sure you don't do it at the expense of other people. The term yeah. the term that I coined for it is compassionate capitalism. 
Great. That is a term that, that that can go far with people. Not George W. Bush's com, compassionate conservatism, compassionate capitalism. Be a capitalist. Make as much money as you can. And we just need that as long as you don't hurt people. We just need one little tweak to what is understood as the American dream. Yeah, and, and I hear that. I, I would even like to take it a step farther and talk about ethical capitalism. Because lots yeah, of people sure. think they're being compassionate when they're not. Sure. Ethics, a foundation of okay. ethics can change society. That's a good point. And, and you know, I, I, terminology aside, we're, we're on the same page here. Yeah. Yeah, we just I, need that one tweak, Sophia, to, to the concept of the American dream. Everything that you said that people have been sold as what America is, literally, again, because we so starkly get the messaging wrong, we're, nobody on the left is arguing that we should change our system in any significant, in any basic way, all we're saying is add one line to the American dream, which is still that that shining city on the hill, still the place where there can be American exceptionalism, where people around the globe should say, "I want to go to America, where I can make anything of myself. I can make my dreams come true. All you have to do in America is take care of the people who help get you there, and then mm-hmm. anything is possible." That mm-hmm. one, all we're talking about is a little gerund in a sentence. I don't know what gerund means. A yeah. little, as long as you take care yeah. of those who get you there, you can have any dream come true. That's the American dream we need. That's it. A little yeah. tweak. I love it. That's the exact kind of tweak that I want to make. All right. We're, let's tweak yeah. that shit then. <laughs> Just a tweak. A tweak and a tweet. That's right. We That's just new. Yeah. Next time you get somebody on this podcast who can actually get drunk with you, ask them to say that five times fast. <laughs> Let's start a new social network called Tweaker. That's maybe it sounds like a drug site. Anyway. Yeah. That sounds like a that sounds like a social media off offshoot for like Breaking Bad or something. <laughs> yes, it does. So I want to shift on to talking about some more personal things and reflecting on life. But just one last thing on the topic we've already talked about ad nauseum, but it really is the question of our day. So I think we need to, to, we keep allowing, like we've said many times already, but this conversation to, 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 to go on, like it's a fair debate, like Megan McCain Mm -hmm. this week on the view past podcast guest, old friend of mine, but said that criticism of Marjorie Taylor green is how we got Trump. And I'll read you the quote from her. I think that the more, I think the more the mainstream media continues to come out and say that all Republicans are birthers and crazy people and we believe in space lasers, then the more it makes traditional Republicans, and there are still a lot of them in the country, go back into their corners. And this is becoming very tribal. I would argue this is how we got Trump in the first place. There's just no nuance to it. I couldn't disagree more. What are your thoughts? I couldn't disagree more. You saw tens of thousands of registered Republican voters change their voter affiliation registration after the insurrection. Tens of thousands said, I don't want any part of this. That is not what being a Republican means to me. And if that is the current Republican Party, I'm no longer a part of it. Right. And if you don't, then what are you? Should be either expelled so that the Republican Party can clean house. Or if she's going to be the face of it, people should be jumping ship. You do not get to be a person who harasses children, children who were shot at in their school. You do not get to be a person who harasses the parents of six-year-old children who were executed in their school. You don't get to be a racist. You don't get to claim that Jews are launching space lasers to set states on fire. This is so insane. The anti-Semitism, the racism, you have to call that out because if you don't call it out, you're complicit and complicity is complacency. You are saying you agree with it if you do not disavow it. So if that's not what Republicans are, Disavow right. her. Right. You know, my, my my favorite uncle, who is a Jewish Republican, disavows this woman. Right. It's and also, the only, benefit of, the only benefit of parties is the platforms. I hate the two party system. I think it causes so much of our division. But if we're going to have it, the only benefit is that this stands for a group of things. So you can just become a decline to state or a Democrat or, or, or a libertarian, or just, I don't have a party and sometimes endorse and vote for Republican policies when you agree with them, but you don't need the label if the label itself is being dragged down to the bottoms of the earth. Yeah. Plus this Jewish space laser thing that they're starting forest fires is ridiculous. I've never used my space laser. Not once. 
I have it in a garage. It's got a nice cover on it. It's mint condition. Wow. I mean, you know, next time I need a laser, I know who, who to call. 100%. I don't know if you're into laser hair removal, but I'm your guy. I am your guy. Honestly, great. I'm Italian. Like, I could I could use it. I don't remember the last time I shaved my legs. It's like, what am I doing? Again, I'm in quarantine and isolation, but that would certainly make it easier. My showers would be shorter. Thank God these broadcasts are waist up. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I am wearing pants. I know that this was a year where lots of people didn't wear pants on Zooms, but I'm I'm wearing pants. They're my oh, pajama no. pants, but I'm wearing them. I'm wearing pants. Boom. Nice. Thank you. Thank you pants very much. Man. I don't wear pants most days, but out of respect for my dear old friend, I put on some pants. <laughs> um, so I feel like despite the fact that you've given up on personal hygiene and are wearing pajama pants midday <laughs> while quarantined in an apartment somewhere I in an Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, that's sweet I just, it's also air drying because I didn't bring anything to dry it with. So it's like kind of curly, you know? It looks good. It looks natural flow in there. Yeah. yeah, I dig. I dig it. So that's that exactly on that on that point. You know, your your hair looks effortlessly natural and wonderful. I feel like you are a tastemaker in life. I think you've got incredible taste. You know, you always have been into interior design and into presenting things beautifully. So I want to know what are the things you're into right now? What what gets you excited? Oh, um, I'm trying to think. That's you know, really in the world thinking about yourself for a second is hard to do. I yeah, guess. I'm like, wait, what? I'm really good at doing stuff for other people. Um, <laughs> I well, <laughs> my quarantine project was raising chickens. Oh, you know, yeah. part of part of my childhood, I, I lived in a little like 5,000 person ranch town in Central California. And I just, there's something about being in sort of a more constant relationship to actual land, like to the earth that I love. And I've been working on my garden for the last three years. And the last sort of thing that I had to do was get the chickies. So... I, I have eight chickens at home and they're amazing. And they started laying eggs in December. Um, that's when the first one came. And now four of the eight are laying. And it's just so cool to have these Did little babies. Better? Yeah. Oh, they're, they're unbelievable. And when they're natural like that, I mean, not they're all natural, but you know, when, when you grab them straight out of the box, the nesting boxes, um, you just put them on a bowl on the counter. You never have to put them in the fridge. It's, it's just like a whole other experience. And it's cool to, you know, pick oranges and grab eggs and make breakfast, mm -hmm. you know, from the backyard. But you're and still so a meat that, eater, right? What? You're still a meat eater? Yeah, but I, I eat a lot less meat than I used to. You know, I, I tried to go fully vegan and literally my hair started falling out and I like became super anemic. And I was like, okay, maybe this isn't for me. Um, maybe the blood type has eating chicken yeah. changed for you? Um, no, but again, I just don't eat as much meat as I used to. You Could know? you eat more chicken? I wouldn't want to, because they're also like a great protein source that doesn't require me to eat anything uh, that mm -hmm. was alive. But you know, I I think about where I get things. Like I try to go to my local butcher instead of just buying like factory whatever at the grocery store. That that's a privilege. It's not one that I take lightly, but it's something that I think about uh, in terms of an, an attainable change that I can make. So I try to do that. Um, it's been really special, that whole experience. Okay. So that brings me joy. My my dogs, my dog, um, I told you I can't speak English anymore. I'm running out of steam. Uh, my dog. Words are hard. Are hard. <laughs> I know. My dog brings me an immense amount of joy. Um, my, yeah, my podcast makes me really happy being able to dive in and, and have interesting conversations with people and, and with so many people who come from different belief systems or ideologies or places. That to me feels like, you know, the real gift of all of this is being able to kind of invite people into a digital living room and have an intimate exchange on ideas, 
you know, again, you can have a discourse with a person in a way that you can't with like a troll army on the internet. So it's I like to have intimate exchanges with people on my OnlyFans. So I encourage people to check that out. Um, oh, your podcast. Hmm? I'm thinking about starting OnlyFans for real, by the way. I think it could oh be very God. popular. <laughs> you endorse this you idea? Like, are you going to start one of those? I'm like, I don't know. I, I think I'm. everybody gets to do whatever they want to do, but I think I'm good. I've got enough socials to keep up with. <laughs> um, tell us about your podcast. Uh, the podcast is called Work in Progress, and I launched it in the fall of 2019. And it is just a space to sit down with people who I really respect and uh, whose minds I find fascinating and talk about the world and their life and how they got to where they are and what they're still learning. And it's it's yummy and fun. And I, I just really love it. That is awesome. Everybody should subscribe to Work in Progress. Um, what are your guilty pleasures right now? Are there any shows you're watching that are... Embarrassing. Um, I don't know. It's funny. I, I got a FaceTime last night from one of my best girlfriends, you know, wanting to make sure I was okay after the Breitbart attack launched. And uh, her husband was like, did you watch The Bachelor tonight? And I was like, no, um, I'm watching this documentary called The Surgeon's Cut and I really love it. Like, I'm just, I don't know. I, I don't I'm into do, Bachelor. I don't do really guilty pleasure TV because I don't, I don't have that much time to watch stuff. So I want to watch stuff that makes me feel excited. Um, yeah. I just started watching Lupin on Netflix. It's a French crime oh. series. Oh, it's so good. Um, good. Yeah. So that that and The Surgeon's Cut have been the things I've been watching this week. You don't watch any Guilty Pleasure stuff? Because I, I haven't either for forever, but I just got so burnt out. Like you said, the psychic drain of four years of Trump. I just had to watch The Bachelor and I'm watching The Bachelor and I'm also introducing my girlfriend to old sitcoms like Three's Company, Family oh. Ties, Cheers. It's been really cool. Oh my God, that's so fun. Okay, so we are well established now that the world's in a weird place. But hopefully we on a day to being better. On a what? Literally the internet cut you out on saying on a something to being better. I couldn't even hear the sentence. <laughs> That feels like an omen. I said, hopefully, on its way to being better. Yep, you're breaking up again. Maybe, no, I, I don't want to hurt. Maybe we just had to say it twice to like really put it out there, you know? Ooh, maybe three times because that's how you call bad stuff. Maybe that's how you call good stuff. Do you want to say the third time? Maybe on its way to being better. <laughs> just make it a jingle. <laughs> Beautiful. I like that. We should all sing that every morning. Please let the world not suck so much. Please let us get better. <laughs> Oh, Lord. Um, so we've been in, and hopefully something we don't repeat again, but an incredibly unique part of history. And while obviously yeah. this pandemic and the stay-at-home orders globally have been very challenging and very terrible for many reasons, there's been some really nice positives for certain people. You reconnect with people you normally wouldn't talk to. You have a chance to put things in perspective. So I'm curious, firstly, what do you think the pandemic has revealed about the world? Um, God, that's, a, I was like, I thought we were doing the fun part. I mean, it is, it's, it's, it's <laughs> oh, yeah. it could be, um, it's just a big question, but I, I think, you know, for me, if anything, it's just really reinforced that we're social creatures. We're communal animals. We want to be together and we have to show up for each other, you know, in, in our activism and in our actions and in what we support. Um, ugh, also, I just miss hugging. I miss hugging people. You're a very good hugger. You're a solid oh. hugger. Thank you. I like I like to hug my people, and I miss that. Mm, same. I do miss that. What you? What's that? Well, what about for you? Like, what's the big reveal? I think it's revealed that people are very resilient and adaptable. Yeah. And that we can make it work no matter what our circumstances are. And I think it also has just shown how strong we mostly are. Hmm. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think the pandemic has revealed about you personally? And how do you think maybe you'll be different when this is all said and done? 
Um, I think that one of the things that I've really realized about this is that I am much more introverted than I've ever had permission to be. Mm. I, I like to work on things out in the world for us, but I need a, I need a little bit of a layer. You know, I, I need, I need to have a space that's, that's inside the zone out there where everyone kind of gets, you know, a piece or to have an opinion or whatever. Um, I, I need a little nest and I, I, I need that to recharge. And I've just never really had the luxury of having that, but being home for a year. I mean, I've never been home for yeah. a year, Same. ever. I went from living in college to living in cities that aren't where my home is. I've never been in my own home for a year. Mm -hmm. And it, it was, yes, hard and things were devastating at times, but there was also a lot of silver linings. And, and I'm very grateful to have had the good stuff that came with the bad this year. And yeah, man, I'm, I was like, oh yeah, I'm an introverted extrovert, I guess. That's, that's what I am. That's an official diagnosis now. And I feel <laughs> seen. Did you ever go a little cuckoo during the pandemic? Did you ever talk to your chickens a little bit more than you should talk to a chicken, anything? I mean, I talk to them a lot. So like, I don't know what too much is. I talk to them, I talk to my dog. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm an animal talker. So I probably have to ask about that. Fair enough, okay. Um, people you know, often see people in the public eye and think they have perfect lives. So in the interest of full disclosure, what would you like to change about yourself? Silly or big or deep or, or shallow? What um, would you change? I would like to spend less time on a screen. You know, I, I spend a lot of time on social, reading the news. You know, I aggregate all of my news feeds and my activist information and all of that um, on Twitter and Instagram. And it's it takes a lot of time, you know, dealing with this insanity that, you know, was unleashed last night took two hours of my evening, maybe three. And then this morning I woke up at eight and I worked on dealing with all of that stuff until I got on Zoom with you at two. So that was another six hours. I mean, it's it's a lot. And I don't take the ability to have an open channel, um, you know, as an activist and as a person who can analyze what's happening in the political landscape and, you know, to, to write and put some of my uh, journalism degree to use, I guess. But I, I do need to figure out a way to carve out more time for myself and my own life and my own pursuits. Um, I would really like to be a person who reads every book I order, but it's mm. probably like, I order a lot of books. I really love to read, but I probably read one in five that I purchase because I, I buy books too fast. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to buy less books because I want to support authors and, and historians and, you know, great, humans who are writing you just burn them for warmth unless it's burning books bad i'm not i can't remember that's, story. I that's bad. that feels okay. that, that, i feel like there was a thing that happened that said that was bad right, um, okay. whatever so you know those those are things i want to work on um okay and i really okay. i really wish i knew like sometimes when i'm cooking i'm just really in the groove and i stop paying attention because i'll like wing a recipe or something and then i don't know how i did it and it's like, when it's good, I'm like, but how did I do this? How much salt did I use and what? I wasn't really paying attention and then it hurts me. So I'd, I'd like to be a little better about keeping track so that- Writing down your recipes, I like that. Yeah, when something is great, I'd like to be able to recreate it. Okay, fair enough. Um, I like that these are attainable goals, Sophia. I'm trying, you know, it's funny. You're, you're right, There's there's this world where everyone thinks that like, celebrities one of words fucking stupid have it all perfect or figured out or like you know just are like shitting money and whatever it's like what is happening 
you know, um, but I, I never want to act as though I know everything or have it all figured out. I certainly don't. I can't, I can't wrap my head around self-care. I'm like, who has time to get up in the morning and like drink a hot water with lemon and wait 20 minutes before you? And like, who's doing Pilates and how and where? Who's showering? My showering has dropped right through the floor during this pandemic. It's not <laughs> ideal. I'm like, who? How are all these people exercising all the time? Like, when do you work? I don't know. I don't know. I don't have that balance. Yeah, I own a treadmill and my only work on that treadmill has been lifting the arms of it back up to think about doing it and then putting it back down a few days later in defeat. I understand that. Do you ever use it as a drying rack when you do laundry? It's a great option. I, I've thus far avoided that because that feels like extra, like I'm not going to ever use it then. And then I'll also, I'm, I'm afraid of the water getting into the gears. I'm a little paranoid about technology. Um, <laughs> Uh, it is time now to check in with the Brain Trust, the Glebe Squad, the Be Glebers in all of us, the Friends with Benefits, the Glebe of Extraordinary Gentlemen. It is time for Twitter answers. Ooh. So I asked all of you this week to close your eyes and think about your life. What memory pops in your head first? So, Sophia, I'll ask you to do that first. Close your eyes, think about your life. What memory pops in your head first? Mm. It's a really sweet one from the summer, but I don't want to share it with people because I really try to keep my personal life on the, in here, you know? Awesome. What is it? It's nice. I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> you can but it was my first memory. I can I can tell you, um, if trying to get a second memory, I can tell you what it was like when my little chicks arrived. Yeah. And I literally opened the little box and there were these little baby birds. I mean, they were... Yeah, like this big. They looked like they looked like Easter candies come to life, like peeps, but they were actually making the sound. And I was like, I have to keep these alive. And it was awesome. I know what you mean because I used to get chicks. <laughs> Hopefully, not in a box sent to you by someone else. <laughs> not Sorry. the way Trump did, correct? Just in yeah. the traditional way. Well, don't do um, that. Yes, indeed. Sheeple on the TV says. First memory as a kid, lying on my front lawn, looking at the clouds and feeling the grass under my arms without a care in the world. And Sarah mm -hmm. Scott at Musical Moriarty said, the days I spent with my grandparents on their farm, I was a kid and everything was so simple. Mm -hmm. No worrying over the state of the world, no fear over tomorrow, just playing outside with their dog, helping grandma cook, riding the four-wheeler with grandpa and hope. So much hope. That sounds so heavenly. So heavenly, but not as heavenly as Pear Bear's answer. Tasting Pillsbury cinnamon rolls for the first time. Mmm. Wow. Yum. Did you say this was your first memory as a kid or just the first memory no. that popped into your head? First oh, memory that popped into your head. I was like, oh, I really bungled that prompt. But no, people just yeah. have <laughs> cool memories. No, of people just, the world's been so shitty that they have to go way back to find a good right. memory that pops in. And finally, there we have a chord. Lady Corbin, my dear friend, says, honestly, Zoom calls with friends pops into my mind first. She's 18, and this is the world we're in now. Yeah. There have been so, some really good ones. There have been some good ones. Telethon for America was fun. It was. Thank you for doing that again. It really was. It was a good time. We Yeah, we've, we've all managed to do some pretty great things together, even though we're apart this year, which has been cool. We, right at the start of the pandemic, one of my best friends had her birthday and uh, we made her a music video and we did it to Dancing On My Own, the Robin song. And we thought like, we should launch the, launch the Dancing On My Own challenge. This is so great. And then one of our friends was like, yeah, but guys, it's this weird moment and everyone's afraid and so many people are suffering and like here we all are like dancing around in front of our like front doors or, or like with our dogs. I feel like this is insensitive. I feel like we shouldn't do it. And we were like, yeah, no, you're right. And, and you know, our girlfriend was like, also it's my birthday video and I don't know, maybe I don't want to be the focus of this. She's like not a person who craves attention. And not long afterwards, Robin launched the Dancing on My Own challenge. We were like, oh, shit. We, it was us. It was us. We started yeah. it. No one will ever know. You're a trend. Uh, you're a trendsetter. I love it. Yeah, but we made a full music video, all of us alone in our homes or apartments, and it was like, it was it was really good. That's cool. I made a music video called "A Long Depressed Year" to the tune of Counting Crows' "A Long December," and it was yeah. 
a summary of what we're, and it was kind of sad. It was kind of sad for comedians. Yes, sir, it sounds sad. <laughs> it kind of was. So <laughs> let's actually for real fun it up for the last couple stories here as we check in for the Thunder Round. Okay, mm -hmm. so yeah, McDonald's is selling Spam burgers topped with Oreo cookie crumbs in China. Two slices of Spam, Oreo cookies, and topped with mayonnaise. Interested or I, I can't. I don't think I can be here anymore. Like, um, <laughs> I don't think. Yeah. No, I don't. First they unleash coronavirus on us and then Spam Oreo burgers? I, Oreos on meat? No. Is spam meat actually? What even is no, it? It's it's a I, don't know. I think it's some kind of astronaut uh, seat cushion material. But delicious because it's. But you know, what I did do during the pandemic. I did. A, I did at one point do Oreos with hot sauce on it with Cholula, and it's actually fantastic. It's I mean, fantastic. I love Cholula and I love Oreos. I just don't think, think about it. It's like a spicy Oreo. Wow. Do you know that? Um, at, oh, it is. I think it's. I think it's that like three six five or whatever. They have at Whole Foods. They have gluten free Oreos now. Oh, they're so good. My Ooh. God, they're good. Now I want a cookie. See. <laughs> You've earned a cookie. I don't. I'm in. I'm locked in. I can't have anything. After your quarantine overlords can bring you an approved cookie that gets scanned for non non virus having. You might just have to get on Canadian Postmates and do this. I think that's a plan. Um, Call the nice man to the desk and be like, I'm so sorry you have to bring me a bag of cookies. I'm so sorry. It's coming. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I think that's the one. He's there to help. He's there to help. Yeah. That's what I believe. And our last story, Sophia, um, a British man who changed his name to Celine Dion during a drunken bender has no plans to change it back. After a bit of imbibing while watching a Celine concert on YouTube, Thomas Dodd is now Celine Dion. He's an enormous fan. He does not regret it, doesn't want to change it back. And according to former artist known as Thomas Dodd, he nearly passed out in his kitchen when he opened the envelope that came weeks later and dimly remembered what he had done. I have so many questions. <laughs> Where? Okay. Because in my Ooh. mind... He was drunk on a bender. He changed his name. I, I envisioned a man drunkenly walking from the pub into some office, day drinking, obviously, because what office is open at night, and, mm -hmm. and requesting to do this. And I was thinking, who let him do this? Maybe they were just having fun and enjoying it. But then now I'm realizing this is a pandemic. It's probably done online. So he nope. did this on his computer, and then yep. the envelope came. Wow, that takes commitment and also if i was drunk enough to get on the internet to change my name i don't think i'd be able to type a url to find the website to save my life so honestly hats off to the guy yes yep one time very drunk in mexico i bought tesla stock because i saw a story that their yeah. engine caught fire and i was literally drunk and i was like in my hotel room like i think tesla's gonna be great i think they're gonna bounce back let's open my scott trade and boom and i made a little bit of money on that so that worked out for me yeah. So you can do good things when you're drunk online. Uh, wow. That doesn't even have to be porn related, really. No, I mean I've I've definitely like ordered a pair of shoes or two, a little tipsy <laughs> online shopping, being like, you know what? I think I deserve those. Yeah, those <laughs> shoes I wanted for like a month, I deserve them. I'm a you're gonna, you're gonna order cookies from the guy from the guy down at the front desk, and then. Also throw some alcohol in the order, and then you're going to be ordering shoes from this guy too. This guy's going to be like, "I'm not bringing you shoes. You're quarantined." He's going to be like, "Why do all these packages keep showing up here? I'm, you're not supposed to open your door." <laughs> My favorite part of this story is 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 uh, Thomas Dodd. Now Celine Dion said, "I tried singing Celine in the shower this morning, and I can assure everyone I haven't inherited her voice." I just love that he thought possibly it was the name that carried the talent. Do, does anyone know how Celine Dion feels about this? We do I'm not curious. know. I'm, that I'm very curious about because it is her name and she is kind of iconic. So Yeah. I'm assuming that if she heard about it and he was with her and she probably looks at him and goes, shall we go for it? I feel like she would send him like a fabulous hat. You know, like one that. of those like incredible things that she's worn to Fashion Week. I don't know why I'm doing this. I think of her as like a sculpture. Um, I, I feel like she would probably send him something cool. 
He should talk about yeah. this on the internet. But I do agree. Once somebody becomes iconic, they should no longer let anybody else have that name. Like when that sports announcer is like, I'm James Brown. I'm like, no, you're not. You're not James Brown. I mean, the poor guy. You, you know there's a guy. I think he's a friend. Well, a friend of mine knows a guy whose name is Taylor Swift. Really? Yeah. A guy named Taylor Swift. You got to change it. Yeah, you can only imagine the emails he gets. Yeah, no kidding. Sorry, there's music playing on my phone because I'm live on SDSC in a minute and I'm logging in while we're finishing our conversation. Um, Love it. You multitask here. Yes, we have to. We have to. Um, thank you so much. I've missed you. I mean, we've we've obviously seen each other and spoken over the 10 years, but we've missed you on the podcast. You're to this day one mm -hmm. of people's absolute favorite guests on Last Week on Earth. Thank you. You're thank the you. best. Thank you for doing it's it. Gonna I wish we could, you know, be together having a cocktail, but maybe in 2022. <laughs> yes, I would love that. I would love that. And <laughs> until then, and until last week, next week, this has been Last Week on Last Week.